Good day, denizens. Today we pick back up, return to China. And uh, you see some images here to start to give us a little bit of instant recall or total recall if you're on with Schwarzenegger. Sorry, never mind. Um, terrible 80s movie. So here we see uh, some images from China as we've talked in the past, and we'll go over these in class. So game on. So we begin by talking about uh, moving on to China. You might recall the last time we really delved into them was when we talked about the Han Dynasty and con compared that with the Romans. Uh, but the Han meet their bitter bitter end in the 220 CE, and China uh, is not united. Um, it certainly does not fall into disrepair. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of technological advances in China, uh, but it's not united again until we see another dynasty come about, which we're about to get to. All right, so what are we getting at here? We're going to talk about two of the most important dynasties in Chinese history, the Tang and the Song, um, and um, talk about their rulers and, and unity and prosperity and all that jazz, some golden ages. Uh, we're going to talk about the Chinese holding on to Confucianism and talk about, once again, the golden age and some of the major achievements, some of the cool inventions that come out of the Tang, uh, most of the Tang, but also the Song dynasties. Some cool stuff here. Okay, and some of the key terms that we need to be familiar with, there you go. Okay, so the Tang Dynasty comes about um, about 400 years or so after the fall of the Han, about over, well over 400 years, I guess. Um, and that's the thing about China is even though the Han fall, and we know that the, you know, the Romans fall in 470 CE, um, unlike Europe, China doesn't fall apart and go into decay. Remember in Europe when Rome falls, Western Europe just falls into chaos um, and there's you know total lack of unity until we get you know pockets of unity like with the Franks with Clovis and you know real friendly folk like that. Um, but in Europe that's also called the Dark Age by some historians. Um, others get a little bit angry calling it the Dark Age but that's just because they're Eurocentric. But nonetheless Europe enters into a dark age where there's really not a whole lot of technological progress. That is not, I repeat, not the case with China. We actually see a lot of farm production increase. We see technology, especially in farming, improve with irrigation techniques and um, various other farming techniques to uh, create more crops. Um, we see Buddhism beginning to spread, although the Tang are going to battle against this. Talk about that in a second. A little foreshadowing. Um, you know, the arts continue. All of these things, um, and that's the other big thing too, is that you know a lot of people that come into contact with the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, uh, to an extent the Tibetans, uh, the Vietnamese. You know, a lot of them, instead of invading and plundering and trying to take over Chinese cities, uh, a lot of them actually adopt Chinese culture. Okay, so the uh, Tang Dynasty here really begins in the early 600s, uh, for our purposes, 600 to 900. There, that's pretty easy, right? Now, there is actually a very brief empire, the Sui Dynasty, S-U-I, at least that's what the lady on the YouTubes tells me how to pronounce it. Um, Anyway, uh, the Sui Dynasty actually comes in uh, and does unite China very briefly, but a lot of historians today just kind of lump that dynasty in with the Tang. Um, the Sui Emperor um, comes to not be very well liked. We'll see that in the video clip. Um, another uh, cool aspect, though, of the Tang, Tang come in there in 618, um, but in the midst of the Tang Dynasty, we actually see um, the first major uh, empress come to power uh, in China in Wu Zhao. So what goes down is this. So uh, the Tang have this rather weak uh, emperor, uh, a guy named Kao Tsung, uh, 649-683. Uh, he was very weak, and uh, he's actually dominated by uh, his second wife or the second empress, uh, Wu Zhao. Um, and in 660, after he suffered a stroke, uh, the empress basically begins running the show, um, handling state affairs. Um, and after the guy dies in 683, um, well, she removed any of uh, her husband's successors, uh, including one of her two sons, um, 
that means yes she had them killed nice lady um and um the other son her youngest son uh she went ahead and put him on the throne um because he was young manipulable uh or easy to manipulate uh, but the other thing is she kept him in prison um and basically she wielded all of the power all of the power as the empress dowager a dowager is essentially um someone who fills in uh, a woman typically who fills in uh as the leader uh because the emperor who is supposed to be emperor uh is unable to do so um and she's actually going to move the imperial capital um and she's going to really weaken the power of a lot of the aristocracy the nobles in china and make sure that the emperor has a lot of power um and then in 688 uh so she orders uh, her secret police uh to go out and crush uh revolts um by tang princes so in other words um you know members of the family the nobility they don't support her being in power uh but luckily for her unluckily for well everyone else uh she has her own secret police who are loyal to her and they just go out and murder government officials and many mem members of the tang royal family um and by 689 she holds all of these you know ceremonies to finally make herself the official ruler of china and um you know this was you know entirely against the tradition of confucianism in china because remember um you know how does confucianism unfortunately view women uh you know it views women as subservient uh to men um but uh you know she she justified her rule by using buddhist scriptures um and following buddhism which is also going to become rather controversial uh in china and uh, she becomes a big patron or, or supporter of uh, buddhist uh, cave temples and, and sculptures um that we'll see um you know in china uh, some that have been there for some time others that will be constructed while she's there um and she actually even uh once she really had consolidated her power in 690 uh she actually proclaimed herself uh, the emperor of a new dynasty that she called the the Chao dynasty, which goes all the way back to ancient China and the old Chao dynasty, which considered the first dynasty for China. Um, historians today um, kind of look back and say, oh, you know what, this is all just still the Tang dynasty because there's so many dynasties. It gets corn fusing, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, she is really the only female um, to rule China in her own right, you know, with all of her power. Um, and only when she became really ill uh and died in 705 were her you know opponents able to restore the tang dynasty and the beat goes on to so during tang rule um the tang uh you know they're conquerors they conquer deep into central asia that's going to get them into some trouble though we'll talk about that here in a couple of slides uh but the tang also you know uh places like vietnam and tibet uh and korea they're going to force these guys to become what we call tributary states we've seen this before remember the assyrians uh and their relationship with the phoenicians where the phoenicians um, had to pay tribute uh to the assyrians in order for the phoenicians to continue to well exist uh and have some autonomy autonomy meaning some freedom to rule oneself so basically this is what vietnam and sorry vietnam lbj called it vietnam um vietnam tibet and korea also became these tributary states to the tang which says you know a couple of things that the tang are pretty darn powerful right well, okay that's basically what it says and you know these places were able to remain independent as long as they sent some money to the tang emperor and acknowledged that yes uh the tang are actually supreme <clears throat> to us but that's the other big thing about the tang and the song is that you know you have a lot of people uh you know quote unquote foreigners coming into China, like the Japanese, Koreans, Vietnamese, even Tibetans, um, though usually angrily and bitterly, uh, coming into China as students, uh, because there's just so much technology, so so much uh, going on in the arts and, and philosophy and law in China, uh, that people are coming to this place, especially the Tang capital, Chang'an, uh, which means eternal peace. And the other thing the Tang do, they restore, ah, there it is, it's back, the old civil service exam. Uh, and they're going to create basically a class that we call the scholar gentry uh, that are going to uh, control Chinese politics and governing policies. 
Um, so yeah, we have this huge civil service system, uh, and of course it's through Confucian training. So Confucius or Confucianism is back. Um, we also see a lot of land reform. Uh, they go out and they break up these huge agrarian holdings, agrarian meaning farming, agriculture, um, that were previously held um, by uh, very wealthy, you know, kind of nobles, um, and they redistribute the land to the peasants. Yay, peasants, you get some land, land of your own. Oh, wait a second, they're doing that so you can pay taxes. Okay, so the Tang government and the economy. Um, the big thing that the Tang do um, is they continue actually what the uh, brief previous dynasty had started. Um, so they, um, uh, had begun connecting these canals and you see this huge system of canals uh, that are going to unite internal China uh, with the coast, um, the eastern coast over here that you see it on the screen on your right, um, and what will eventually become the Grand Canal, um, which is already there actually, they, they just improve it greatly. Um, this Grand Canal is going to link China, but not only that, but now all of a sudden, because you have linked the internal uh, areas, the, the uh, you know, more landlocked areas of China, uh, now you have linked those to the coast. Uh, and you know, if you're a farmer um, out there in the middle of nowhere, you, know, you can now ship your crops out to be traded uh, on, a, on a more globalized market, uh, which means that you know, you're gonna make uh, more money and more profit and more encouragement uh, to grow more stuff, uh, which also means more food and more people because you look down here at the population statistics, you know, 7th and 8th century, 6, 700s population, 50 million. By the 800s, aka 9th century, this is all CE. We're, we're in CE now. Well, let's just stay in the CE. Um, 80 million people. I mean, that is a lot of people, um, you know, period, obviously. But, you know, for back then, that, that is a whole lot of people then too. And uh, the main capital, uh, this is the, the Daiming Palace, uh, which means great brilliance. Um, and this is actually part of a, a huge complex, um, not like a psychological complex, but a, a huge physical building complex um, where the emperor stayed. Now, this is not to be confused with the Forbidden Palace. That's going to come a little bit later. Uh, but it's kind of along that same idea uh, where we just have this huge government complex for the running of government affairs uh, and, you know, a nice cushy place for the royalty to stay. But um, uh, Xi'an, uh, the, the main city there, called Xi'an today becomes the, the capital city. Uh, and here I just listed you know, some of the Chinese dynasties for you just to give you an idea of what's going on here. So you can see the Han back here. I, I guess you can't see my arrow, but I see it. And I'm pointing at Han right now in the parentheses. Um, and then you see the very brief dynasty there, but then the Tang and the Song, uh, the Yuan will come here later. Uh, that's the next PowerPoint. Just you wait, a little foreshadowing for you, uh, where Kublai Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, yes, the Mongols are going to take over China, um, and then eventually the Ming, and finally the Qing dynasty, um, which will be the last dynasty in China in the 20th century. Uh, but nonetheless, so this city basically was at the start or end, however you want to look at it, I guess they would say, well, they'd probably say both, I guess, uh, of the Silk Road. So you can imagine just how much profit, how much money, how many items are coming into this place. Uh, this is also roughly the site of where Xi Huangdi uh, is buried. Uh, remember the dude with the terracotta army? Uh, well, they still haven't found his... Um, his actual, you know, burial place specifically, but they have found the terracotta army uh, in this city, this area. Well, as all empires do, uh, the Tang will eventually fall into decline. And one of the big issues is corruption uh, within the Tang dynasty, um, which is pretty typical, I guess, um, which, which leads to rebellions like the Lushan Rebellion. Um, but another big thing that's going on is all the way out on the far western edges of uh, the, the Tang Empire, the, the Chinese Empire. Um, basically, you start, obviously, along the Silk Road, you start touching into Central Asia, uh, modern-day Tajikistan and uh, Kyrgyzstan, um, Uzbekistan, the Fergana Valley, Kazakhstan. That's why we had to know all those stands. I can't stand it. Um, all those places, well, Islam is also spreading out there uh, by 
the 700s. So basically the Chinese and Islamic forces are going to clash out there. We're going to talk about that in the next slide of the Battle of Talis. But, you know, it's the same old story for the Tang. They fall into disrepair uh, because of corruption. Taxes get too high. Uh, you actually have some famines. I, I mean, imagine, you know, having famine with all this access to water routes and everything else. So that really shows just the corruption uh, in China uh, with people starving, not getting access to food. Numerous rebellions, the biggest of that being the Lushan Rebellion uh, in Northern China that the Tang really aren't able to completely quell, uh, completely able to get rid of. Um, and increasingly in these distant provinces, you know, you have different families who are just starting to become autonomous to rule themselves. Um, so, you know, I mean, the Tang come in and they crush some of these uprisings in various places, but they never really gain complete control. Um, and, you know, it could be with the famines and the crushing of rebellions and everything else. I mean, maybe, you know, 30 million people may have been killed overall from the, from the population. Um, and by 907, a uh, rebel army will overthrow the last Tang emperor. Um, but to point something out here, how the Tang organized themselves, um, they used something called the Fanzhen system, uh, where basically you had these regional governments. So this is very much like the Persians with the satraps, right? Just called Fanzhen, um, which literally means a buffer town. Um, but, you know, over the course of time, the, the guys who were in charge of these, these Fansen and uh, the, these kind of distant provinces, they begin to gain more power because they're just so far away from the emperor and from the central government. Um, and moreover, just the meaning of the term buffer town, a, a buffer. A buffer is like a um, in-between place, um, almost kind of like a frontier uh, that's, that's there kind of to protect the main interior from outsiders. Um, so basically, you know, it, troops are asked to settle out in these distant places to keep order. But, you know, the problem is, is that they start to become uh, loyal to locals and begin to uh, look after themselves and not rely upon the central government. But a, a key battle and a key turning point in world history, it ne wasn't necessarily a key turning point at the time, uh, but in hindsight, and what the, the effect of this over the next 50 to 100 years after this battle uh, is going to change things drastically in Asia. It's called the Battle of Talis. And the Battle of Talis uh, is actually named after the Talis River in Afghanistan. <clears throat> and it happens in July of 751. Um, and if we put this into context, right, uh, go over, you know, thousands of miles, thousands and thousands of miles to um, the west over to Europe, right? And we talked about earlier the Battle of Tours, 732 in France. Well, <clears throat> this is less than 20 years later, this Battle of Talis. Um, and by this point, what has happened is um, China, the Tang um, Empire, has stretched all the way out to this boundary into Central Asia. And of course, this is, you know, buffering, uh, or, or I guess uh, not buffering, but coming up against the Silk Road um, and, and surrounding the Silk Road. So obviously, you know, they want to control the Silk Road because, well, it's money, it's profit. Um, but Islam is now also spreading by the 700s into Central Asia as well. Um, and we see one of the great caliphates in Islamic history, the Abbasid uh, Caliphate. Um, and they raise an army and they actually get some allies who the Tang thought that they could rely upon. Uh, and in the midst of this battle, they get the allies to actually, the allies who were supposedly allied with the Tang to actually switch sides and attack the Tang from behind while the Abbasid forces are attacking from the front. And the Tang are just absolutely slaughtered in this battle. Um, but here is the big outcome of this thing. You know, the Chinese lose control of the Silk Road. Uh, they lose control of their Western provinces. Now Central Asia is going to fall to Islam, including, for example, the Turks. And fast forwarding in history, as we've already done, right, the Turks, like the Ottoman Turks, and there are numerous other Turk or Turkish groups uh, who are now going to turn to Islam. And Islam is still, you know, a very powerful faith, uh, perhaps the predominant faith in much of Central Asia in places like Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, um, and even uh, parts of, of Kazakhstan. Um, and don't forget Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. Uh, but nonetheless, so <laughs> this is the other big thing too, though, is that 
you know, Islam does stop at Talus. So even though they win at Talus, they stop there in terms of their eastern expansion because they're more focused on their western side where they are dealing with the power, of course, of the Byzantine Empire. In the 700s, remember, the Byzantines are still pretty powerful. Um, so that ends their Arab expansion to the east. So you'll put that in context or compare that or perhaps contrast that with the Battle of Tours all the way over in France, you know, 19 years before this. Uh, Islam is also halted there, but it's halted because of a European victory against Islam as opposed to an Islamic victory. Um, so Islam has now been halted uh, to the most distant west and most distant east. And here you can see on the map where the Battle of Talus uh, takes place there in modern day Afghanistan. And just to try to show you uh, more broadly, uh, where this battle is um, on the map here, um, uh, showing you there in you know the outskirts of Central Asia, uh, where this conflict takes place uh, along the river, and you can see that you know this is a major juncture, um, not only where these empires meet, um, the Abbasid and the Tang, but also where the Silk Road runs through. Here's an AP topic. So if you're in uh, on level or honors, I don't know, tune out. So here we go uh, for you APers out there. Um, you can see this far western province of China today. You know, today China has a few uh, what they call autonomous provinces. In other words, provinces that are allowed to basically govern themselves. Um, they don't necessarily have to be governed by the central government. <clears throat> and one of these um, is Xinjiang province, and it's to the far uh, west there, the dark green you can see on the map on the right, or the red that you see on the map on the left. Um, and it's uh, predominantly Islamic, uh, so, so Islam in China. Um, and the ethnic group, uh, the predominant ethnic group, uh, the Uyghurs, um, are this Islamic group there, and you know they come into conflict with what is now in charge of China, the, the Communist Party. Uh, and China has a lot of issues uh, with this region and uprisings, things like this. And to make things even more complicated, um, you know, in recent times, the last 20 or 30 years, they've found a lot of oil and various minerals uh, in the ground out there in Xinjiang province. Um, and also, you know, this is where China gets its natural gas and you have this, you know, a lot of ethnic groups. So, um, you know, a lot of conflict in this province to this day and a, and a lot of political issues to this day. Okay, so once the Tang fall apart, um, shortly thereafter, a new dynasty is gonna come along, the Song. Um, and the Song dynasty, we will talk about next time. Thanks for tuning in. Good day, denizens. Welcome back. As we continue here, talking about the Song Empire. So the Song come in right around 960, and they're going to be in there for you know 300 years uh, until 1279. Um, but you know, like the Tang, they're going to deal with constant invasions from the outside. Uh, especially this time, it'll be the Mongols uh, by the end of the 1200s <clears throat> coming in there. But nonetheless, the Song and before them the Tang, uh, they're also going to have a major golden age um, with all kinds of new inventions and, and new ways of doing things. Um, and we're, we're going to see wealth, culture really, you know, um, at least from China, really dominate all of Eastern Asia, you know, from Vietnam in the south to you know, Korea in the north um, east, um, where, uh, you know, just... Sang, tong, tang and song, you know, technology, wealth, all of these things become, to an extent, beneficial across the region. Um, and, you know, Japanese students, Korean students coming in uh, to study in this great, you know, pretty amazing place. Uh, the economy is going to grow quite a bit under both the tang and the song. Um, uh, we see, you know, more farming, uh, you know, more grow, growing of wheat. Uh, you, they are actually come out with new uh, strains of rice or new types of rice, which of course is going to increase the population, uh, lead to surpluses in food. And as you know, you know, if there's a surplus in food, people don't have to worry about finding food and eating. So instead they focus on things like trade, making money, learning, the arts. It's important to point out too, though, that this is also, once again, a very Confucian empire. And Confucianists, actually, in regard to trade, uh, hold merchants in low esteem. A, a peasant is seen as um, a higher level in Confucianism than a merchant because a peasant 
you know, even though they may be poor, they still make things with their hands. They make their own product. But Confucianists view merchants as these people who make money off of money. So they don't really make anything physical to, to give back under Confucianism. So merchants never really held in high regard. And this will be huge too when European merchants start trying to come in um, into China uh, by the you know, 1500s, 1600s. Um, in 1700s, where the Chinese are going to be rather hesitant to allow them to come in, and for other reasons as well, which we'll delve into later on. So some of the things we start to see come out, like the mechanical clock. Um, the mechanical clock actually was used to, to keep in tune with the heavens, uh, quote unquote, um, during the Song Dynasty. The, the Chinese had, you know, long been uh, concerned about tracking the stars for astrology, you know, horoscope purposes. Um, and, you know, for the emperor, um, the, the conjunctions of the heavenly bodies, the, the coming together and, and the movements and, and relationships of the heavenly bodies, uh, these were indispensable uh, in terms of guiding action, right, uh, public and private, uh, whether it's making war, peace, um, sowing and reaping crops, hoping for a good harvest, uh, conceiving an heir uh, with the empress, um, you know, all of these things uh, – the emperor needed to know uh, in terms of timing to be in alignment with the stars. Um, and to facilitate these calculations, um, under the Song Dynasty, um, you know, engineers there built a, a series of uh, remarkable you know, clocks that we see here basically for star tracking uh, to, to track and display the apparent movement of the stars. And the clock mechanism that drove the display was hydraulic, in other words, a water clock uh, linked to a, a bucket wheel. Uh, as each bucket filled, it activated a release mechanism that allowed the big drive wheel uh, to turn and bring the next bucket into position. Now, the water clock itself was, you know, no more accurate uh, than, you know, these types of devices can be, right? Uh, but in combination with the wheel, you know, it could be adjusted to keep time within a minute or two uh, a day. Um, and, you know, by way of comparison, uh, the ordinary drip or flow water clocks uh, that were then being used in Europe, they probably varied by a half an hour uh, or more a day. So, uh, you know, the Song Dynasty, very, very um, mechanically inclined um, with, with this kind of technology, but of course they're using clocks for a different reason than say the Europeans would have been. The other big thing uh, is block printing. Block printing um, actually comes out during the Tang, uh, the Tang Dynasty, but it's the song then that put this into action. Um, and uh, in China, uh, the technique of, of printing uh, with carved blocks, like I said, it appeared all the way back in the late, really late 600s, early 700s under the Tang. Uh, but it really reaches its golden age during the Song. Um, and basically emperors encourage you know, publication of large numbers of books uh, by central and local government. So this called for using more print. Uh, now, movable type uh, itself, like moving the type, moving the blocks, um, was first created uh, in 1045. Um, the invention of, you know, reusable movable type uh, made books cheaper and, you know, more available. Um, we'll see uh, Johannes Gutenberg uh, later on, not until the 1450s, uh, come out with what is called the printing press. Um, but in terms of block printing, yeah, that had already been around for quite some time uh, from the Chinese. And then we have gunpowder. Uh, gunpowder uh, is really kind of an accident. Uh, an alchemist um, mixed sulfur, charcoal, and salt pepper together to see what would happen uh, when it caught fire. And it flashed rather brilliantly. I then decided to pack that uh, black powder, i.e. gunpowder, um, of course, they wouldn't have called it gunpowder at the time because they didn't have guns, so we called it black powder, uh, into a hollow bamboo shoot to see what would happen. Well, uh, the bamboo packed with gunpowder shot flames out of the ends, uh, and basically, you know, the rocket was born. Um, when, when the powder, would this guy be the rocket man? Um, Elton John, no. Uh, when the powder was packed tightly, uh, you know, and both ends were sealed, it became what we call a firecracker today. Uh, soon everyone was using these rockets and firecrackers for entertainment, celebrations, uh, to scare off evil spirits, uh, promote prosperity, all these types of things. Now, it didn't take too long, though, for somebody to figure out uh, that with these rockets, these firecrackers, that these could be used militarily. Um, 
And there are verified historical reports that rockets uh, were actually used against Mongol invaders uh, around 1279. Um, and as explorers such as Marco Polo in the 1300s, late 1200s, early 1300s visited China, uh, they returned home with gunpowder, fireworks, rockets, uh, and the knowledge needed to create them. Um, and interestingly, even today, uh, China still remains the, the king of fireworks. Today, the country manufactures and exports about 90%, it's estimated, of all the fireworks on the planet. How about that? Sunglasses. So Chinese bureaucrats would use sunglasses um, with quote unquote lenses uh, made from clear quartz. Uh, and then they would tint those glasses, um, the, the quartz, uh, with smoke. And the idea was to keep the glasses dark enough to keep others from seeing the wearer's eyes, right? So the darkened glasses were worn by judges in Chinese courts to prevent people from reading their eye expressions. If people argue in a case, you know, could read the judge's reaction in his eyes, then they might alter their statements or, or change their argument or whatever to try to sway the judge. So sunglasses, uh, not those sunglasses, but sunglasses. Well, those as in the picture. I always think you can see my arrow. You cannot. Uh, the sunglasses you see in the picture obviously are a little bit more modern day. I'll let you read about government under the song. Uh, you know, trade flourishes under these two empires, the Tang and the Sung. Um, you have a lot of merchants coming in, India, Persia, Arabia. Now, remember, once again, uh, you know, the, the Chinese weren't overly welcoming to merchants. Um, so merchants weren't exactly, you know, coddled or, you know, really greatly taken care of. Uh, but nonetheless, it still did bring in, you know, trade goods and China trading goods as well, because, you know, the Chinese government did like money, uh, i.e. gold. Um, and then Chinese uh, merchants would, would carry goods to Southeast Asia, you know, trade for spices and, and various types of you know, wood for, for building, things like this. Um, we start to see paper money, what they called flying money, uh, because, you know, just paper. Um, but, you know, paper money being used to represent gold uh, for trade. And, you know, China just becomes this, this major critical center uh, for trade, commerce. So the court and the gentry and the peasantry. So um, the gentry, gentry basically is, is a, a, a noble. Uh, it's actually what the uh, England in uh, the Middle Ages feudalistic times would have called their uh, nobles, the gentry. Um, and specifically the scholar gentry, these, these you know, scholar officials who come to, to run the emperor's court, uh, but also to run the government. And, you know, because they're wealthy, they could take all that time to study for the civil service exam that we talked about way back. Um, and this also brings back Confucianism, right? And Confucianism becomes the basis for Chinese law once again under the Tang and then especially the Song. Um, and, you know, these new Confucian schools that come about, you know, they, they uh, stress and encourage things like, you know, proper behavior, you know, a duty to one's country, uh, ranks in society and social orders. Uh, the, you know, the reality is that though, by and large, most Chinese were peasants and um, they worked out on the land and what they could produce, that's what they used to live. But of course, they also had to pay taxes, especially, you know, using the food that they made. Um, now, if you had extra time, you could, you know, maybe sell some other stuff that you make, like uh, embroidery. In other words, making like you know, cloths or, or decorative um, uh, silks or cloths, uh, you know, baskets, whatever. Um, and you could go to the local market and you trade for things like salt and tools, things like that. Um, but, you know, the peasants out there in the middle of nowhere really relied more upon, you know, each other or your, your local village uh, elder, you know, really to, to solve disputes and things like this. You know, the central government, they're way far away. So here we see uh, the Chinese merchant class. So under Confucianism, they actually hold a, a lower status, right? Because they get their wealth from others working, whereas peasants get their wealth or lack thereof, uh, from, well, their own labor, them working. Um, so they don't necessarily hold a very high level. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of merchants weren't even allowed in certain areas of China to settle. Um, but 
the big uh, advantage of a merchant is you do have access to funds. So you could ha actually, you know, send your kid uh, to school or, or start educating your kid, um, you know, to prepare for the civil service exam, and then you know he could enter the scholar gentry. Um, but that being said, you know, this Confucian attitude toward merchants, you know, this is going to have uh, some repercussions uh, for the Chinese government in terms of economics. You know, um, you you have rulers, you know, who who want trade, but they also want to control it. So they're going to limit how much power merchants have and how much access to goods merchants have. So over the long term, this is not going to be necessarily a healthy policy uh, for China's economy, especially international economy and international trade. Women um, under these uh, dynasties, um, women are going to uh, gain a little bit more prestige, uh, especially because of the flourishing of the arts and writings. Very prominent uh, female writers uh, and, and artists will emerge. Um, but you know, you also have Confucianism uh, running you know, the culture here. So you know, uh, f women ran quote unquote family affairs at home, even though really the man is you know, still considered to be in charge under Confucianism. You know, people wanted boys. Uh, you know, boys were able to take the civil service exam, you know, potentially. Um, and, you know, once a woman became married, you know, she basically, uh, you know, eschews her old family and becomes completely, you know, um, part of the husband's family. Um, women could not remarry. Um, we, we see a terrible practice called foot binding that's going to emerge by the 900s, the 1000 CE. Um, and, you know, this foot binding, it actually begins in the imperial court. In other words, the, the wealthy, uh, emperor's folk uh, in, in the court and uh, in, in the higher classes begin to actually try to make their feet smaller. And the next pictures aren't exactly something to look at for too long. Um, what they would do is, you know, the feet of young girls would be bound with these long strips of cloth. Um, and basically it would just stunt the growth. It would break the, the metatarsals basically of the foot, which are the, the top bones um, on your foot. And, you know, cause them to have this abnormal growth. And you can see, you know, a, a shoe up there in the upper right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine wearing that. Um, you know, and tiny feet with a stilted walk, that suddenly becomes a symbol of nobility and beauty. And think about that. I mean, do we still do something to this effect today in terms of how we um, regulate our own, own bodies to try to meet some certain standard? Um, Peasants didn't quite understand this practice, right? They needed their kids, their daughters to go out and work in the fields. So they're like, why would I, you know, break their feet? I need them to work so we can eat food. Um, but, you know, most women, you know, they, they had to submit to this. This becomes part of the upper class and, you know, the lower classes want to emulate, copy this. Um, and, you know, this even further reinforces the whole idea of um, Confucianism where women quote unquote, belong in the home under Confucianism, right? Because um, you can't leave. It's too painful. It should be terrible. Um, so just a little uh, thing, interesting side here. Uh, foot binding continued in China even after it was officially banned at the start of the 20th century by the 1900s. Uh, one, one modern woman uh, who experienced the foot binding said, quote, my feet hurt so much that for two years I had to walk on my hands and knees. Sometimes at night, uh, they hurt so much that I could not sleep. I stuck my, my uh, feet under my uh, mother as she lay on them, uh, so they hurt less, unquote. Um, you know, and, and foot binding, like I said earlier, broke the end step of the foot, right? Uh, sometimes it could result in feet only three or four inches long. Um, and yeah, I mean, women who had these bound feet would have to stay very close to home. But two, the arts and literature really flourished during this time. What is really cool here on the left, that is actually silk. Um, and um, this, this painting onto the silk, uh, this sketching onto the silk. The thing is with silk, uh, once you start to put art onto it, there's no going back. You can't wipe the paint off or anything like that. So what you see in that picture is the first rendering of that picture. That's simply amazing. It's beautiful uh, art, this type of landscape. Uh, painting um, and calligraphy that comes out. Um, 
uh, that's you know trained to the the upper classes, and you know this this just becomes huge, and it also plays into Taoism too, right? Uh, because the whole idea of the landscape, nature, is very much part of the Taoism and the spiritual essence of the natural world. Um, so we would see mountains, forests, you know, very vivid portraits even of emperors, and sometimes even scenes of city life, but most especially the the countryside. And here you see a very famous one, um, Scholar in a Meadow. Um, Western artists have often relied on preliminary sketches and the ability to paint over mistakes. Chinese artists who used ink uh, on silk paper, however, did not enjoy such a luxury. They considered a painting to be a philosophical exercise in which the artist fully conceived the subject of his work and the emotional impact it would have before committing a single line to the paper. This method demanded a high degree of technical skill and planning. You think? Yeah. So in other words, that's the first rendering. Amazing. Um, China also we see a lot of multiculturalism, right? We see the influence of Buddhism um, because eventually the Indian stupa, remember that, the heap, uh, the place of worship, is going to evolve once it gets into China in something called a pagoda. Uh, and a pagoda, well, you see it there on the left, really cool building, uh, multi-storied um, with the eaves that curve out at the corners. Um, and you have a lot of Tang and Song uh, sculptors who create a lot of, you know, Buddhist uh, statues of Buddha. Um, and, you know, even today, a lot of people think that the Buddha is Chinese. Uh, no, he, he was Indian, uh, but he becomes very strong in China. That being said, uh, the Tang for a brief time actually tried to crush Buddhism. So Buddhism could have taken off perhaps even more uh, or what you know, they would call there in China Mahayana. Um, but it is actually going to be... Um, hindered by some of the, the rulers uh, leading in China, uh, mostly because uh, under Confucianist tradition, uh, you know, Buddhism grants this kind of equality to all people, but under Confucianism, you know, you're supposed to fit into these, these roles. And we see other arts flourish as well. You can see uh, some of the cool uh, porcelain uh, that comes out, and Westerners just had to have this stuff, uh, what they called, quote-unquote, Chinaware. Uh, and this is stuff that was highly traded on Silk Road. And a huge flood of literature comes out, uh, especially from um, women. Um, Lai Ching Xiao uh, discussed the experience of loneliness when loved ones went off to war, for example, and her, her writings uh, became pretty highly read back then. So, so women are able to find an avenue to express themselves and have some power and um, some impact on society as well. Um, we start to see the first, you know, real, um, I guess, kind of novellas, which is a short novel, right? These stories about romance and, and fantasy and adventure, all these things are coming out. Lots of poetry, um, and a lot of this stuff is talking about Buddhism and Taoism, or at least is influenced by it. Um, but also talking about, you know, how long life is or short life is and, you know, just how big the universe is. This is kind of philosophical contemplation. So all of this stuff coming out. Um, during uh, the Tang, but most especially the Song Dynasty, uh, as we roll into the 11 and 1200s. And that finishes off China, at least for now. But we'll be back to it. Just you wait. Until then, signing off.